And as he writes next, by these promises you may become partakers of the divine nature. Now this line strikes our ears with an off note. We will share in the divine nature. Does this mean we become gods? And this has been one way that this line has been understood. Especially in the Eastern Church, this is a major proof text for their position that salvation means our ultimate divinization into the Trinity. Of course, the problem with this understanding is this was a more common pagan idea within Greek thought. Now, Greek ideas varied, but in certain ways and for some heroes, the end goal was to become, in essence, divine. And yet, in contrast to this, the entire Old Testament is super clear that the Lord is God alone, and we are not God and never will be. The transcendent and inaccessible glory of the Lord can never be attained by humanity. And the New Testament does not depart from this Old Testament orthodoxy. Thus, for Peter to depart from these orthodox roots, to pick up an idea from Greek paganism in this one line, isn't, real, isn't realistic. Besides, the word here for nature often refers to attributes or characteristics expressed by one's nature. It doesn't mean essence, but one's attributes. Thus, what Peter means is that we will be partners in the attributes of Christ. God remains God, and we will remain human, but Christ will share with us his glorious moral attributes, righteousness, purity, and holiness. And Christ will share with us the blessings he won for us, resurrection, everlasting life, and incorruptibility. In short, the new creation reality created by Christ's resurrection is our participation in the divine nature. It's our glorification. And this is why these promises are the greatest, no exaggeration. No more death, no more sin, no more evil or harm but to live in paradise before a loving and all-powerful God. Peace and joy beyond imagination. No philosophy, no government, no technology, and no other religions can make such promises. And no other person can deliver on such promises as our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And yet, they are still promises, which means they're yet to come to full fruition. A promise awaits fulfillment. Once the promise comes to pass, it then becomes a reality. Thus, we are not full partakers of Christ's divine glory now. We haven't yet tasted of the resurrection. We haven't come into the eternal peace of holiness. Yet, as Peter says next, we have escaped the corruption in the world by sinful desire. Now, this basically refers to our conversion, our coming to Christ.